One of the reasons I, I refuse to give up Christmas Eve is I don't want to get stuck out there shoveling snow on Christmas Eve. <laughs> hey, if you're here tonight and you got drug in by your family or your friends, let me be the first to say or the third to say you're welcome. Nice to have you here. You're actually very fortunate. This is my shortest message every year. Yeah. And that means something to people who go to church here. And, and I also have videos, so... It's all good. It's all fun. You know, pastors, I have people say this to me almost uh, about every month. Somebody will walk up to me and tease me and say, and the other pastors, what's it like to only work one day a week? You know? And yeah, they get that kind of look. But um, I was thinking about Santa, you know, and I go, why is everybody in love with this guy? He works one day a year, and then he spends the rest of the year judging us, you know? So I don't feel really bad about this. I really don't. This happened earlier tonight. And, uh, you know, for those of you who want to know when it took place, it was on the other side of the world. Um, he's not making it over to the northern hemisphere. So just a little warning in case you didn't have enough presents under the tree. Actually, I, I, I'm glad you're here tonight. I, I've got a, a quick but impactful message for you. And I want to go back and tell you a little bit about the Christmas story, which we normally do on Christmas Eve, and the word we're going to be looking at tonight is the word joy, and that's a word you see all over. We sing songs about joy, and let me tell you, there's a difference. In fact, it's the theme of the Christmas story is joy, right? That's why we say Merry Christmas, but there's a difference between happiness and joy. A lot of times people confuse the two. They think it's just an older use of the word happiness, but it's not. Happiness is all about Right circumstances, your happenings happening right. And as a result, you're happy. You got tickets to the game, you're happy, right? Joy is this choice you make no matter what's going on in life. So whereas happiness is external, joy is internal. And the biggest part of joy is having what I like to call the gratitude attitude. I want to show you a little video and pay attention to this because it's really powerful in the message that it speaks to you to, to take... Uh, a gratitude attitude in all the little things in life. I do. I'm so guilty of taking it for granted. And, and I, I was telling one of the other pastors just last night after the evening service, I just said, you know, I don't want Christmas to ever be just Christmas. I says, I want it to be about what it's about in my life. And I go, and I got to think about how I communicate that well tomorrow night. And you know what? Um, I don't want us to take it for granted. My goal tonight is you're going to walk out of here with a new renewed sense of having some lasting joy in your heart because of what I'm going to tell you, what God's going to tell you through me, really, about what's true. You know, in the Christmas story, Mary and Joseph are, of course, main, main figures in the story, right? 
And a lot went wrong for them right up front. When you read the story, Luke covers Mary's part of the story. Matthew, the Gospel of Matthew covers Joseph's part of the story. And I want to set the stage for you. This is in Luke, and this is about what happened to Mary. And I think we've all heard the story, but listen to it anew with me. In the sixth month, it says, of Elizabeth's pregnancy, Elizabeth ends up being the mother of John the Baptist, the forerunner to Jesus Christ. But they were relatives. So to set the stage of giving a timeline, she's pregnant. God sends an angel to, to Nazareth in the village of Galilee to a virgin named Mary. She's engaged to be married to a man named Joseph. He happens to be a descendant of King David. Gabriel appeared to her and said, Greetings, favored woman. The Lord is with you. And the next verse says, Confused and disturbed. I guess so, right? So Mary tried to think what the angel could mean. And don't be afraid, Mary, the angel says, for you have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you will name him Jesus. And he will be very great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his ancestor David, and he will reign over Israel forever. His kingdom will never end. So you're a teenage girl. And all these things that the angel just said, these were titles she understood very well in her faith. The son of the most high, the throne of his ancestor David, reigning over Israel forever, kingdom that goes on without end, right? She knew the significance of those words. So it says Mary asked the angel, but how's this going to happen? I'm a virgin, right? Good biology question at that moment, right? And he say, the angel says, the Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the baby to be born to you will be holy, and he will be con- called the Son of God. Now, I could just see Mary standing there, popping her hand up at this moment, going, excuse me, could, could you fill me in a little bit more on that overshadowing thing, right? What's she thinking? And then he goes on to say, what's more, here's Elizabeth again, your relative Elizabeth much older than Mary. She's been barren her whole life, has become pregnant in her old age. People used to say she was barren, but she has conceived a son and now in her sixth month. For the word of God will never fail, Gabriel says. Amazing transition. Mary responds, excuse me, I am the Lord's servant. May everything you have said about me come true. And then he's gone. An amazing, mature response for such a young woman. I'm willing to accept whatever God has for my life. She's engaged to be married to Joseph. And then she has what we know in theology is this virgin birth. And you want to talk stressful, you know. And uh, we've talked about Mary's circumstance. You've thought about this before, how hard that must have been to explain this story. I want you to see this little scene so you might, this dramatization from the movie Nativity, that you might be able to really start to get a feeling for how hard this must have been on her. Joseph. Joseph. Come on, Joseph, come on. Come, Joseph, come on. Elizabeth, my dear, come on, Joseph. 
لازم نهز هالبيت اليزابيث عسى عذبا And I got to tell you, um, how does she explain this to Joseph, who knows that he hasn't been sleeping with her, right? And you think of all the stress and the anxiety that would be brought on on a young woman in this situation, right? And yet, she didn't miss God's purpose for her life. That's why she's in the, book, the scripture. In fact, I, I think most people under these type of circumstances would miss the purpose of their life. Why? Because we don't make the choice that Mary makes. And that's what's so significant about this story is the choice she makes. She was afraid, but what did she ultimately do? She chose to trust and believe God and accept his plan. Again, look at that verse there. She said, Mary responded, I am the Lord's servant. You know what she's saying? I, I belong to God. He made me. He's got a plan for my life. I'm willing to accept whatever he wants. May everything you've said come true. An amazing mature statement for her to make. However, this is going to play out. She's saying, I'm, I'm in on this, right? And, and I, it, it hit me this week. Have you ever said that to God in your life? Have you ever said, hey, God, I, I know you're there and I'm going to trust you. But I'm in on it the way you're going to bring it into my life. However, it's going to happen. He made me. You love me. You got a plan, I'm going to accept that plan, even though I don't understand it. That was Mary. I got to tell you, happiness always flees in the midst of stress and anxiety. Always. But joy can still work because joy is reasoned. And the reasoning for Mary was there is a God and I trust him. I want you to look at the next verses. The dramatization we just saw from the movie Nativity actually shows her coming back from her cousin Elizabeth, the much older woman. But the, Luke records that a few days later, Mary, after getting the angel's information, goes to see Elizabeth. And she greets her. And at the sound of Mary's greeting, Elizabeth's child leaped within her. And Elizabeth, it said, was filled with the Spirit of God. And then, of course, Elizabeth says, I gave a, gl a glad cry and explained to Mary, God has blessed you. She knows what's going on. Because her own pregnancy is miraculous. It's a story that's earlier on in the scripture. God has blessed you above all women, and your child is blessed and she says, why am I so honored that the mother of my Lord should visit me? And when I heard your greeting, the baby in my womb jumped for joy. That would be the future John the Baptist. And she says in verse 45, you are blessed because you believed that the Lord would do what he said. And then, of course, Mary rejoices right there in God. Her story is stressful. Doesn't have any easy answers for her family, certainly not her village, and yet she chooses to rejoice. I mean, she's literally catapulted into a situation where, in some circles, she could have been taken outside the city walls and stoned to death for being pregnant outside of her engagement to her husband. And yet she says in this story she was blessed because she believed that God would do what he said he was going to do. Now, the other side of this story is who? It's Joseph. And the interesting thing about the story of Joseph and Mary is Joseph isn't there when the angel Gabriel comes and talks to Mary, is he? He gets his own fill-in briefing a little later. But have you ever considered, you saw the look on his face in the, in the video, how wounded he was when he gets the news that his wife-to-be, the woman he loves, they've never had sex, and all of a sudden she comes and says, Honey, I've been overshadowed, and I'm pregnant with the Son of God. I, don't try that, ladies. I don't think it'll work. I mean, he has every right to be angry and, and to be hurt. But here is the key, and I've often missed this in the story, to Joseph's reason joy in his life. He never sought to retaliate against her. You know, he could have had her drug out and, and brought before the, the men to have the rocks thrown at her. He never got resentful or bitter in the story. In fact, he showed her grace. It's in Matthew's gospel, and here's how Matthew records it. He tells us right up front that whole story we just read in Luke. He sums up in one paragraph. This is how Jesus was born. His mother Mary was engaged to be married to Joseph, but before the marriage took place, while she was still a virgin, she became pregnant through the power of the Holy Spirit. Joseph, to whom she was engaged, was a good man and did not wish to disgrace her publicly. 
and decided that he would break off what was then a year-long engagement in the Jewish culture quietly so as not to expose her to any more ridicule. I mean, he loves this girl. He recognizes she's been unfaithful to him, yet he doesn't want to expose her to public disgrace. He doesn't want to hurt her because she's hurt him. By the way, it's enormous that he was willing to protect her because the consequences could have been so grave. So he planned to quietly call off the wedding. And then Joseph finally gets pulled into the story. The angel Gabriel appears to him and says, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife. The child within her was conceived by the Holy Spirit. I think only an angelic visit could have got him to possibly imagine that this story was true. And she will have a son, and you're to name him Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. Now when Joseph woke, the verse says, he did as the angel commanded and took Mary as his wife, did not sleep with her until after Jesus was born, and he named the boy Jesus. What, what's the, there, there's a little, a, a lot of relief there, I would imagine, right? And some, um, some great gratitude on his part to know, you know what, my wife's telling me the truth, and my future wife is telling me the truth. But the fact that he chose to be gracious when he could have been hurt and reactionary tells you a lot about the depth of his character. And it really tells you in the story, as great as Mary's part in the story is, that Joseph was equally a part of that, that God chose these two to literally to this exalted task, right? To bring the Son of God into the world. Now, here's the part of the story that's always fascinated me. God could have gotten Mary and Joseph together right at the get-go, right? Kind of explain the whole thing to them together. Angel can come and talk to them at the same time, right? But the story indicates he's intentionally tells Mary first, and meanwhile, Joseph goes through all the agony. What's God doing? He's testing the man's character. Is he going to get angry or mean or vindictive? You know, life does that to us. We have opportunities sometimes on how we're going to respond and how we're going to look at things. And, and we go through things, right? We don't always have the answers at the moment of what's, go, what's going down or why it's going down. We have a choice who we're going to be and how we're going to be. There's a little application here I want to tell you. You need to understand something. Because one, one of the biggest sins, certainly one of my life, has been resentment. Some of you I know struggle with carrying a grudge, I used to. It's been a long time since I've suffered with that, but it is the single most worthless emotion on the planet. Do you know that? It does nothing except make you miserable to be resentful towards somebody else. It never will change the past. Bitterness will never, all the bitterness in the world will never make you feel better. It'll actually swallow you up whole. But here's the thing. Somehow in our minds, we think if we can hold on to that hurt, and the more we rehearse that hurt in our mind, we think somehow we're getting even with them while we're rehearsing it in our mind, right? And we're not hurting anyone at all. While you're out there thinking, I can't believe what they did to me. You know what they're doing? They're down at the village eating the Cinnabon, getting ready to ride the gondola, you know? <laughs> and what are you doing to yourself? You're making yourself miserable. So now you have to decide, what is it you want in life? Do you want to be bitter? I think there's a great lesson here from Joseph. No, we don't want to be bitter. We want to be blessed in life. And here's the truth. You listen to the, sto the story of Joseph and Mary, and the longer I've lived, the more I know about what I'm about to say is true. You go, oh, yeah, there's the facts. Mm -hmm. If that was me, never would have handled it the way Joseph did, not the character I've possessed in life. How many of you women in here think you could have handled it the way Mary handled it? We don't have that strength, Right? The strength to deal with that kind of stress. That, that is, that's some real character going on there. And let me tell you this. This is exactly why we need a Savior. You know, some people kind of revile against that. But God sent us a Savior at Christmas, not just a baby. Because he knows we can't do it on our own. And I want to tell you, believe me, if God didn't need a Savior for us, he wouldn't have wasted his time to send one to us. You know, over 2,018 years ago, an angel comes, and, he, and he's out, and, and, and he uh, appears to these shepherds in the field. In fact, for years, I hear this from people that are skeptics about Christianity or God in general. And they say, you know, if there's a God, why doesn't he just unzip the sky and reveal himself to us? And then we'll all follow him, right? 
And I said, well, do you know that he actually did unzip the sky one time? Because when he appeared to the shepherds, the sky was opened up, and there the glory of God was revealed. And the angel said, uh, don't be afraid, because these guys are quivering in their boots watching this. He says, I bring you good news that will bring great joy to all the people. And what does he say? The Savior. Yes, the Messiah, the Lord, has been born today in Bethlehem, the city of David. You know, what do saviors do? They save you from something. And in this case, yourself. I had a Christmas card that I've kept for years. It said, if our greatest need had been information, God would have sent an educator. If our greatest need had been technology, God would have sent us a scientist. And if our greatest need had been money, God would have sent us an economist. And if our greatest need had been pleasure, God would have sent us an entertainer. But our greatest need was what? Forgiveness. And so God sent us a savior. And the incredible part of what we celebrate this time of the year is that God came into the world just in the same way that all of us have come into the world, through a birth canal, to bring us these tidings of great joy. I want to give you, as we wrap up here, a, a, just a sneak peek of what the Apostle John, who wrote the Gospel of John, when he opens up this grand book of his about the life of Christ, the very first thing he says, and it's a little cryptic, he says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So whoever this Word is, he's God, right? And then later on, 13 verses later, John reveals, the Word became flesh, and he lived among us, and we beheld his glory. If you had to choose the name of the single person who has had the biggest impact on the world, the one life that has touched every continent, every culture, every tribe, every language, there is just one name. I'm not hyping this. There's one name. And I want you to think with me for a moment here. He was born 20 centuries ago to an impoverished couple in an obscure village in an unimportant corner of the world. Maybe a few hundred people ever met him face to face personally, Jesus. Maybe. Thousands, a few thousands heard him teach. But he never traveled outside his region, the circumference of which was 30 miles. Think of that. He never wrote a book. He never held an office. He never led an army. He never governed a nation. He didn't even have a home. And yet over the next 2,000 years, that one name would inspire the founding of more universities. Do you know how Oxford started? Do you know how Cambridge started? Harvard, Yale, and the other Ivy League schools? Do you know how they started? And so many others? The creation of more hospitals, the launching of more charities, the writing of more books. Just think of the expression of the great art we have today and the music that we have today. Guess who? The power of that one name would be so great. Even those who deny him in our culture that I'm aware of, I don't know about other cultures, often use his name when they're extremely frustrated. This name would move more people to sacrifice their lives, their finances, possessions, safety, careers, than any other name in history. And think about this. The instrument on which he met his death, the cross, the mode of execution, the most horrendous way to die in the Roman Empire in the first century, has become the single most recognizable symbol all over the world. The movement that he began isn't just historical, it's actually growing. You know, in America, it's pushback time for Christianity, and, and I think God has a lot of good reasons for that, but it, it seems like, you know, it's a struggle to call yourself a Christian today in the, in the public square. But I want you to know, and I'm not exaggerating one bit here, in Africa, in South America, and in the Far East, Christianity is exploding. Uh, a missionary that I support, K.P. Yohannan, just sent me this Friday a letter. In this letter, he wrote, I was thinking, you know, about 
Uh, well, let me read KP's letter, and then I'll tell you what I was thinking. I don't want to get ahead of myself. He says, in many areas throughout the 12-plus nations where we are serving, worship places are having their walls torn down and expanded in order to cope with the growth that is taking place. In Myanmar, which is formerly Burma, he goes, I met with the pastors of over 400 congregations. He says, I was amazed to hear that almost all their congregations had either doubled or tripled in the past few years. They are continuing to grow. So it would be like taking Sierra Community Church, which runs about 600 people on a Sunday, pretty good big church for a small town. And in, in three years from now, we're 1,800 people. That's what's happening in these places. And um, KP went on and, and told me in another spot, he says, I talked to this one pastor. He said, last year, there were 50 families in my church. He said, this year, I have 350 families in my church. It's growing. So I'm thinking, if you could have gone back, you know, 2018 years ago to Bethlehem and told them there's this little baby being born in your village tonight, and, you know, a little over 2,000 years later, people are going to be gathering around the world to remember his name, sing songs to him, and hear his story. Who would have believed that at that time? But here we are. And the obvious question should be for us tonight is Why? Because science does their best to trivialize him. Atheists do their best to mock him. Other world religions do their best to discount him. And, politician and religion, politicians and religious leaders use their best efforts to use him, right? What is it about the man that continues to inspire, move, haunt, captivate a planet full of people? He is mentioned in all the five great world religions. Did you know that? The book of Quran mentions the name of Jesus 93 times. Jews accept him as a rabbi and a popular teacher of his century. Hindus and Buddhists call him a very wise and holy man, right? Which harkens in my mind to say, well, maybe you can tell me then why I shouldn't listen to him and listen to you. Because that's not who he says he was. Something more than just human history was happening that, that night in the town of Bethlehem. That's why we're here. The more part. Everywhere he went, he brought people, if you read the Gospels, to a decision. In some cases, right up to the very end of his own life. Imagine this. When he died, he's hanging on a cross, and there are two thieves hanging next to him, it says. And, and one of the dying men is taunting him and basically saying, ah, oh, you know, you can save... Save, if you're the son of God, save us and, I say, and get off the cross with us, right? But the other thief had a change of heart while he was hanging up there. And I, I believe, this is my theory. He heard Jesus say to the very people that put nails in his hands and that were cursing at him from the ground, forgive them, Father. They know not what they do. And so that thief had a change of heart. And he turns to Jesus and he says, will you remember me when you come into your kingdom? Close to the, a dying man's last words, right? He's out of time. He's out of hope. He's out of religion. If there was ever a time to say, sorry, too late, bub. And yet Jesus turns to this guy and says, truly, truly. You know, I couldn't tell you anything more true than what I'm about to tell you, Jesus says. You will be with me today in paradise. God coming to earth is such a monumental truth. The God-man entering time and space. The Apostle Paul, and I love to show these verses at these kind of services, just as a reminder to us all, said, tells us about this journey. How does a God who's created the universe come to earth, right? He exists in the form of God, Paul says. Did not regard equality with God something to hang on to, right? I have to empty himself. Or he has to empty himself. He says, I took the form of a bondservant. The God of the universe. And I'm being made in the likeness of a human being who I've created and being found in the appearance as a man, I humbled myself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. He didn't come here just to be some grand teacher or some grand example or our buddy. He came, and he says right there, to be obedient to the point of death, to die for us. Because that was the cost of sin. Which in turn makes his coming in the first place so very important and why we celebrate it. Jesus said these own words about himself shortly before he was crucified. No one 
can take my life from me. I sacrifice it voluntarily. I have the authority to lay it down when I want to, and I also can take it up again. This is who we are worshiping at Christmas. Not just a baby in a manger. And do you believe the one we celebrate coming into this world was who he said he was? It's the best Christmas gift I can offer you. Just a few days before Jesus entered triumphantly into Jerusalem, and I say triumphantly because you know in a few days he was hanging on a cross, but they say up to two million people laid palm fronds at his feet when he rode in on that colt. And part of the reason for that was just a couple of days before that, he was in a town called Bethany, and he was visiting his friends, Mary and Martha, whose brother Lazarus had died. And Martha came to him and basically asked him, why weren't you here? Because you could have saved my brother. And Jesus said to Martha, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. Powerful words. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? That is a question for everyone who has ever lived, and especially for those that have heard the message. And on this day, he left that conversation, went to where the tombs were, and cried out in a loud voice, Lazarus, rise. And a man who had been dead four days walked out of his tomb. That's where the, the theologians and commentators say, good reason why two million people came to watch him, because the word spread all over the countryside during the great feast of Passover, where literally a million people more plus Jews would come in to Jerusalem. They all wanted to lay eyes on him. I believe one day you'll stand before him and the choice is yours to make. And I also believe that Christmas is one of those rare opportunities to be reminded of God's great love for us. And I would simply ask this in closing, if not Jesus, then who? Then what? Religion? Religion is man's attempt at earning credit with God. Wishful hoping that there's an eternity and I'm good enough to get there when I die. I hear that so much today. I don't know where we get that idea. Had there been any other way, don't you think God would have spared his son the ordeal and the agony of coming to earth to die for our sins? If religion or something else could have worked for us? The Apostle Peter had his eyes opened at Christ's resurrection. And he said, unashamedly, in front of the people that could take his life, there is salvation in no one else. God has given no other name under heaven by which we must be saved. This is the great hope of humanity. That you can be forgiven and thereby live forever. For God... So loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever should believe in him would not perish but have everlasting life. What do I do? Just in case you're wondering that, what do I really do with this? The prophet Jeremiah, speaking for God, said, God told him, you will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. I don't have to beat you over the head. I merely need to point to you to who he is and then tell you, if you're honest enough with yourself to pray a prayer that says, I don't even know who you are, God. Jesus, I, I've never believed in you, but if you really are who you say you are, then you've got a lot of power and a lot of insight into my soul. And I'm telling you, if you are who you say you are, don't leave me behind. Find me. I prayed that prayer once myself. And God will reveal himself to you if it's seeking him with all your heart. Because he says, here I am. I stand at the door and knock. And if anyone hears my voice and opens that door, I will come in. It is the great promise and the greatest gift God has offered the world and the greatest gift I can give you tonight. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for the hope of eternity and for the life of your son and his willing sacrifice. 
And Lord, I just pray that this would sit in our hearts and our minds tonight. And for those of us that are skeptics, I pray that we would pray that prayer in all honesty between ourselves and you and put you to that test. I pray all this in Jesus' wonderful name. Amen.